from Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, kiddo. Carter at Universal Adjustment. Jim, how are you? In a rush. I have to catch a plane to Tucson, Arizona. Lucky you. Nice there this time of no, year. No, no, listen. One of our brokers out there wrote a 50,000 straight life policy on a man named James Lansing. Lansing dropped dead two days ago. Uh-huh. And you'll never guess why. I'll bite. Why? Mr. Lansing starved to death. What? With a 50,000... Honest. He died of malnutrition. Got the coroner's report from Tucson right in my hand. Well, if a man could buy a $50,000 policy, he ought to be able to buy himself a square meal. Yeah. Johnny, flight 203 leaves at 1045. You interested? See you at the airport, Jim. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account. Submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. Expense account item one, $178.13. Cost of plane ticket, Hartford to Tucson. I shaved, showered, packed, and got out to the airport in time to have breakfast there. Jim Carter found me at the cashier's gate. Hey, kiddo, you won't need a coat out there in that desert country. As usual, Jim Carter was bigger than I thought. A man who stands six foot five always is. A little ruddier, a little more blustery, but as efficient as ever. I wrote a special delivery airmail to the insurance commission in Arizona this morning and explained it worldwide. They wrote the policy. We're holding up payment pending investigation. Well, you could have told them that in person. We'll be out there as soon as the letter. Well, I like to be formal on these things, especially with the state commission. Besides, I just as soon let them think we'll get around to a routine investigation later in a week or two. In other words, you didn't tell anybody we're coming. No, I didn't. Maybe we can work it better this way. The faster we move in and find out what's what and aren't bothered by anybody, the better off we'll be. Hey, give me your ticket, will you, Jim? Yeah, sure. Here you are, pal. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Johnny, that commission is going to get formal sooner or later and ask a lot of questions. Mainly, why doesn't Worldwide honor the claim and pay off the beneficiary? So we'll have to skedaddle and get ourselves some good answers for him. Yeah, sir. Hey. You may board the plane. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, pal. Has anybody asked that question yet? Well, the beneficiary, sure. Uh, James Lansing's sister, named uh, Arlene Kennedy. She called the broker, and he referred her to claims division at Worldwide, and she called them long distance, and then they called me. I told her to put her off for a while, telling her it was just routine. I see. Is she going to be tough? Yeah, she could be, Johnny. I understand she has money of her own, and she has some influence in and around Tucson. Oh, a lot of money? Yeah, and trust. She's very comfortably fixed. Yeah, watch yourself, kiddo. Yes, uh, Mrs. Kennedy's pretty upset by the whole business. Can't blame her for that. James Lansing died on the street with no identification on him. By the time police found out who he was, a routine PM had already been performed to determine cause. You know, the county was going to bury this guy? With $50,000 worth of insurance? Yeah, <laughs> imagine that. Oh, excuse me, lady. Yeah, the post-mortem never had happened unless Lansing dropped dead on a public street. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, I requested the coroner's office in Tucson to hold the body until we can get something done. Better fix your seatbelt, Jim. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Yeah. First thing that occurred to me when I saw the PM findings was that it might not be James Lansing at all. Chronic heart condition, lung history, debility. Doesn't sound like anybody worldwide would insure. Lansing took a physical before the policy was issued, didn't he? Of course he did. See, have you got any material on his insurance examination? Sure. Right here. Standard form. James Lansing was 100% okay when the policy was issued a couple of years ago. Malnutrition, lung history, chronic heart. How could he get in that bad shape in two years? (laughs) That's a pretty good question, Johnny. I bet the answer is going to be great. Yeah. What's the examining physician's name? Uh, let me see. Examining. Oh, here it is. Uh, Dr. Carl Mayhood, Suite 932, Valley National Building, Tucson. He's our first job, Johnny. 
Hey, cute stewardess. Yeah. Well, back to business, kiddo. It was a long trip, and I spent most of it going over the material in Jim Carter's briefcase. By the time we circled Tucson Airport at 4.45 in the afternoon, I had the facts pretty well in mind. Expense account item two, 350, cab fare, Tucson Airport to the Pioneer Hotel. Jim Carter and I took adjoining rooms. I unpacked my clothes and got on the phone. A Sergeant Younger, Tucson Police, had made the DOA report on James Lansing. Yes, he was in. Yes, he'd be glad to talk to me. I left Jim Carter contacting the state medical board. Glad to meet you, Mr. Dollar. How do you like Tucson? Well, I've been here two hours, Sergeant. Weather's certainly nice. About like this all through the winter months. It's a little warm in the summer, though. Yes, sir. Um, now this Lansing matter. Yeah. There isn't really much to tell you, Mr. Dollar. One of the cars answered the call. A man was found dead in the doorway of a jewelry store about four blocks down the street. Uh Uh-huh. This was the day before yesterday, Sergeant? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I went down to the scene and called the coroner's office. No identification on him, so we started to check him out. Took a little while. By the time we got a make on him, the coroner had already performed an autopsy. Yeah, I understood that was about the way it was. Say, tell me, how did you identify him as Lansing? One of his prints matched up on our cards here. Lansing was booked on a traffic beef a year ago. Otherwise, we'd still be trying to make him. You're sure it's Lansing over in the morgue? Yeah, we're sure. His sister came down and identified him. Name of Kennedy. Yes. Well, what did Mrs. Kennedy have to say about the cause of death? Nothing. That malnutrition bit didn't do a thing for her, huh? Not a thing, no, sir. We all thought Lansing was some sort of a transient. You know, just some old bum until we identified him. Uh-huh. Any witnesses see him die? No, we haven't found any. According to the coroner, he'd been dead an hour or so before anybody noticed him at all. Happened early in the morning. I see. Say, did uh, Lansing have any other business down here other than that uh, traffic violation? Nope. All right. Uh, who do I have to see to get into the morgue? Well, I'll phone the coroner for you. Won't be any trouble there. You want to go over now? No, later on, maybe. Uh, Dollar. Yeah? Death was from natural causes. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Then no matter how much you investigate, you people are going to have to pay off. Well, aren't you? Maybe. We just have to be sure of one thing. What's that? That we insured the right man. By the time I finished with Sergeant Younger, it was six o'clock. I phoned the hotel and Jim Carter, busy and efficient as always, had already gotten the vital statistics on Dr. Carl Mayhood. Northwestern University Medical School, 1940. Army Medical Corps, 1941 to 45. Dr. Mayhood's license to practice medicine in Arizona was issued in June of 1946. Married, two children, income and practice, according to Carter, was average. In person, Dr. Mayhood was a tall, blonde man in his late 30s. He looked like he needed a week's rest and a few laughs. Day and night. You have an alarm clock around the house, Mrs. Garland? Well, use that. Yes. Goodbye. Yes, sir. Dr. Mayhood, my name's Johnny Dollar. I'm from Hartford. I represent the Adjustment Bureau handling a claim for worldwide insurance. Well, what does that mean? I'm an investigator. So? July 14th, 1953, you examined a man I'd like to get some information about. I hope this won't take too long. Uh, Was it an insurance examination? Yeah. The man's name was James Lansing. Do you happen to remember him? James Lansing... No, I can't say that I do remember him, Mr. Dollar. What about him? Well, I'd like to show you the standard examination form first. Is this your signature? Hmm. Is that your signature, Doctor? I suppose so, yes. I don't know. Aren't you sure? Well, how many people are certain of their signatures? It looks like my signature, Mr. Dollar. I can't say for sure if it is or isn't. All right, what about these? Are these notations on the form in your handwriting? I would think so. I don't know. It it looks like my handwriting. I can't say. According to this form, you gave Mr. Lansing a complete physical and pronounced him sound. That's my job as a doctor on these insurance examinations. Anything unusual about that? Mr. Lansing died two days ago, doctor. There's nothing unusual about that either. 
Did they send you all the way from Hartford so I could tell you to go back there and buy a book on heart disease? You can get them anywhere in the country. The simplest kind. Not even a doctor's book. Read it. Know it. And don't take up my valuable time. Now, let me have that. Sure. Hmm. This patient Lansing was 41 years old. If he had no heart condition when I examined him two years ago, and obviously he didn't, according to my findings, it's entirely reasonable to assume that he could have developed heart trouble in a very short while, even the day after I examined him. You people gauge those things in your premiums. Why do you bother me? Are you finished? Huh? I take it you've had yourself a tough day, Doctor, and you don't want to be bothered with anybody. Now, look, I'm not here to bother you. you Just from what's on this sheet and what's happened, you're in enough trouble to get yourself involved in a police investigation. I'm here to try to avoid all that, for you as well as me. And please don't lecture me on heart trouble, incidentally. We know the statistics by age, race, color, climate, state, religion, occupation, geographical area, and sex. It so happens we don't have to go into that, Doctor. James Lansing died of malnutrition. Hmm? I said Lansing died of malnutrition. I'll be doggone. Coroner's report. Look for yourself. Hmm. Well, he should know. Now... Was it possible for you to overlook that condition at the time you examined Lansing? If he'd been suffering from malnutrition in any degree, I would have discovered it and noted it. According to the coroner's findings, James Lansing had been ill several years. The lung and heart condition existed at least ten years. Can you explain how you were able to pronounce him physically fit, doctor? No, I can't. Well, how about this, the angina condition? I could have missed that, but it's unlikely with the degree of aggravation noted here on the coroner's report. Have you had much experience reading chest x-rays, Doctor? Of course. The lesions reported by the coroner. If there had been any lesions on Lansing's chest, I would have reported them. I can't explain that either. Well, now you understand why I'm here. Certainly. I wish I could help you. You can. Just let me see your file copy of the examination and the x-ray you took at that time. I'll have my nurse look them up. I don't keep files over a year old up here. We have a place down in the basement. Okay. I'll have them for you tomorrow. What time tomorrow? As soon as possible. I'd like to have them first thing, Doctor. You're kind of on me, aren't you? That's right, Doctor. I'm kind of on you. <laughs> be another intriguing episode in our story of the Lansing fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow, $50,000 is a good price for a killing. Most anybody will listen for that kind of money. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Mayhood, I sent you a copy of Lansing's insurance examination this morning. Did you get it all right? Yes, I did, Doctor. Thank you very much. Just looked it over. And I take it everything's all right. It's an exact duplicate of the one sent to the insurance company, and that part's okay. 
But it doesn't straighten out matters on this case. I am not concerned with your case particularly. I just hope you're through bothering me, Mr. Dollar. Not quite. Well, what does that mean? I want another hour of your time, Doctor. I want you to go over to the coroner's office with me and look at Mr. Lansing's body. What for? To identify it. I've got to know if he's the man you examined or not. About an hour? Doctor, I can get an injunction. All right. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Tucson, Arizona. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is a further accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. Or was it a fraud? Expense account item three, $10, loan. To Jim Carter, who was working with me on the case. Thanks, buddy. I'll pay you back as soon as I can cash a check. Been so busy, I haven't had time. How's your doctor, friend? Well, I'm going to pick him up pretty soon and go over to the coroner's office. I want him to look at James Lansing and see if he's the same man he passed on the insurance examination two years ago. Either we insured the wrong man or Dr. Mayhood examined the wrong man. I don't know which. How have you done so far? Well, besides what I told you yesterday about Dr. Mayhood? Yeah. Well, he's in healthy financial shape. Not good or bad, but, you know, healthy. His house halfway paid for, he owns one car outright, and has eight months to go on another one. All of which doesn't mean anything if he phonied up an insurance examination. Yeah, that's true, kiddo, that's true. You know, I've been thinking, this would have worked, but James Lansing died on the street and the city performed an autopsy. Death, malnutrition. For a private physician, without an autopsy hanging over him, it could have been heart failure or most anything. Jim, I think we can do whatever we want around here. Step on anybody's toes, make any kind of noise we like. With this kind of situation to investigate, we don't have to be careful. Easy, Johnny. Lansing's body's in the morgue. There's no doubt that it's him, Exhibit A. But we aren't sure that his $50,000 policy was issued legitimately. What are you getting to? Call the state insurance commission, Jim. Let them know we think this is a bad one from top to bottom. Let them know that so that when the beneficiary starts to complain, they can tell her. It might scare her and whoever helped her into being more ridiculous than they've been already. I'm going to hold off, Johnny. Why? Till I see how you and Dr. Mayhood make out at the morgue. Expense account item four, two dollars, cab fare. From my hotel to the Valley National Building. I picked up a scowling Dr. Mayhood and we drove over to the coroner's office. Mr. Dollar, this is a waste of your time and mine. Sorry to inconvenience you, Doctor, but it's necessary. I suppose so. And I suppose you have a job to do. But I have a job, too. Mr. Franks, the insurance broker, telephones me and says he's sending over a man for a physical. I do the physical. It's immaterial to me whether the man I examine is qualified for insurance or not. My job is to examine him. It's up to the insurance company to determine... Yeah? Johnny Dollar, this is Dr. Mayhood. I believe Sergeant Younger phoned. Yeah, yeah, this one. Dollar, it's up to the insurance company to do what they want to about the examination. I understand all that, Doctor. Then don't ignore it with your high-pressure tactics. Because examination is the only part I have to do with this business. I examined a man named James Lansing two years ago. You have a copy of my findings on that examination. I stand on them. And don't forget it. I don't forget for one minute. Nor do I forget that what you found and what an autopsy surgeon found are completely different opinions on Lansing's physical condition. Here we go, boys. There's the body. Pull the sheet back, please. Yeah. Well, Doctor? I called my lawyer after you called me today. I won't be intimidated, Mr. Dollar. You aren't being intimidated, Doctor. You're being asked to cooperate. Then maybe I don't like the way you ask for cooperation. My attorney will be in my office to represent me if you bother me any more about this. You want to look at this body? Your attorney can't refute what's already been established, Doctor. You pronounced James Lansing in good physical condition two years ago. An autopsy report shows that when he died two days ago, he was in very bad physical condition. So bad that two years ago he couldn't possibly have gone through a careful examination in your office without some of the symptoms being detected by you. Where is your medical degree and what responsibility? Oh, why don't you shut up and take a look and tell me if you've ever seen this man before? I won't be spoken to that way. Just a minute. 
I'll get an injunction and I'll charge malpractice and negligence if I have to. Oh? On what ground? You're being stupid, Doctor. All you have to do is look at that corpse and tell me if he's the man you examined in your office two years ago. Well? I don't know whether I've seen this man before or not. Well, does he look familiar in any way? I can't say. I might have examined this man. I don't know. This is James Lansing, Doctor. The name you filled in on your physical examination for the insurance. I know that. Is this the man you examined? I don't know. I honestly don't know. It was two years ago. If I see a man for three hours in the course of a physical examination, am I expected to remember his face or any details about him two years later? Is there any way you can determine whether or not this is the man you examined in your office? No. Not that I know of. Is there any way you can determine it? Believe me, Doctor, I can try. And I did try. That afternoon, over the protests of Dr. Mayhood, I took all of the personnel connected with his office down to the morgue. A nurse, a receptionist, the x-ray technician, and a laboratory worker. None of them recognized the body of James Lansing. Expense account item five, ten cents, one phone call to Jim Carter, who'd spent the day preparing the necessary forms for the insurance commission and gathering data on Lansing's beneficiary. You think Dr. Mayhood was in on it? He's too mad, too belligerent, Jim. You don't sound too sure. Well, and maybe he just strikes me as an inept doctor. Well, let's say Mayhood's way down on my list. He examined a man who said he was James Lansing. It could have been anybody. All right, we'll let it go that way for a while. Any ideas? I'm on my way out to Lansing's old address. He had an apartment on the other side of town. I want to see how he's lived out there. Still want me to go ahead with the insurance commission? Yeah, go ahead. The manager at James Lansing's apartment house happened to be a woman named Anita Regan. She also happened to be willing to go back down to the coroner's office with me and view the mortal remains. There you are. Oh. Have you ever seen this man before, Mrs. Regan? Yes, yes, sir. That's that's Mr. Lansing, apartment 34. You're positive? Oh, yes. I've seen him every day for almost two years. Okay. Want to smoke? I want to get out of here. Oh, sure. I don't know why I'm acting this way. He doesn't look any different now than he's looked before. I've seen him stretched out like that a hundred times. What? I mean, almost like that. Out, stony. Only I guess it's because I knew he was just drunk then, not dead. Oh, I see. He was crazy carrying on the way he did. Oh, feels good to be out in the sunlight again. Yeah. I'll take that smoke now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, sure. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Lansing used to get up around ten every morning. He'd look awful, but he was always kind of nice, polite, you know. He'd be regular as clockwork. He'd walk past my door and tip his hat and go right down to the store and come back in a little while with a sack of groceries, a bottle of milk for his cat, and some donuts for himself, and some booze. Uh-huh. And then he'd just lock himself up in his apartment and stay there all day, drinking. Real alcoholic, huh? Well, I'd say so. At least I wasn't surprised he starved to death. He can't live on whiskey. He was fried to the ears by noon every day, as long as I knew him. Mr. Lansing didn't work then. Well, I think he tried to sell real estate once, a long time ago. Oh? But how could he? I understand he was a retired engineer or something like that. He pays rent? Oh, yes. Always seemed to have enough money to get along. Did he have any family, Mrs. Regan? Well, I know he's got a sister living in town somewhere. What about his friends? He seemed to do all his drinking alone. Say, you're from the insurance company. You should know about his family. Apparently, there are a lot of things we don't know. Hmm? A man named James Lansing moved into your apartment house two years ago. He didn't work, but he had enough money for his rent and his liquor. He also had enough money to buy some expensive insurance. Very expensive. Somehow, he passed an insurance examination, and then he suddenly died. No one, nothing. Just one beneficiary. Mr. Dollar, you don't suppose somebody just gave him enough money to get along so he'd drink himself to death, do you? That's one way of looking at it, Mrs. Regan. Oh, that poor man. That poor, poor man. (laughs) 
I spent another hour with Mrs. Regan, gathering as much background as I could about the last two years of James Lansing's life. I also spoke to the janitor of the building and two of the tenants. They all verified the fact that Lansing had been drinking heavily for better than 18 months prior to his death. No one seemed to know why. Jim Carter had an answer. I talked to our man in L.A., Johnny. Lansing lived there before he came to Tucson. He had several arrests for drunkenness, never married. One time he made his living as an engineer. Finally, he got fired for drinking on the job. Yeah, just one of those chronic cases. First arrest was back in 1939. How's the beneficiary holding up? The sister? Yeah. Well, Mrs. Kennedy was pretty upset when the insurance commission notified her we were in town making an investigation, indignant, put out, things like that. She wanted to know how long it would take. This all comes secondhand from the insurance commission. Uh, Johnny, Hmm? a broker named Hillary Franks sold a policy. What have you got on him? Hillary Franks has represented worldwide insurance in this area for 17 years. Uh... (laughs) You're stalling, kiddo. Sure, I'm stalling, Jim. Because we're right down to the meat of it now, and it makes me sick. There's only one person who stood to benefit by having James Lansing insured. That's the beneficiary, his sister, Arlene Kennedy. So? Jim, you know as well as I do, somebody else had to take the physical examination in Dr. Mayhood's office. Someone had to help her arrange that. Someone had to help her get Lansing's signature on the policies. She couldn't have pulled it off by herself without gumming it up. She had to have expert help. Hillary Franks. Yeah. Hillary Franks. 17 years broker, worldwide insurance company. Okay, the salesman's the first one to come under suspicion in a case like this outside of the beneficiary. So let's get on with it. All right, Jim. Uh, One thing. What? Hillary Franks knows we'll be looking at him, and he knows he's under suspicion. That worry you? A little bit. After 17 years in the business, he should also know where we're going to be before we get there. If he did something as dumb as try to work a $50,000 fraud on his own insurance company, he might do something even dumber. If so... Well, what's the 38, Jim? Here. From now on, Johnny, you better carry this. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Lansing Fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, tomorrow there's a bit of excitement when a pair of thieves start a falling out. Matter of fact, a lot of excitement. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Arlene Kennedy. You called my home, Mr. Dollar? Oh, yes, Mrs. Kennedy. I'm with Universal Adjustment Bureau. We're investigating the matter of James Lansing's death. Your what? We're investigating your brother's death before we take action on your claim as his beneficiary. Under the circumstances, we have to do this, Mrs. Kennedy. I'd like to talk to you about it, if I may. How would you like to talk to my lawyer, Mr. Dollar? Sure, if you think it's necessary. I'd rather talk to you first. Why? 
Well, frankly, the insurance company isn't satisfied that this is a legitimate claim. You mean you're not satisfied? All right, then I'm not satisfied, and I represent the company in this matter. Look, we won't get anywhere this way, Mrs. Kennedy, if you'll just... (sighs) Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Tucson, Arizona. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. $50,000 worth. Expense account continued. Item six, ten dollars. Car rental to get to Catalina Vista, where Arlene Kennedy maintained a fifty-five thousand dollar home. It was a warm, sunny day, incredibly clear. I enjoyed it in my drive. However, I can't say I enjoyed Arlene Kennedy. That's as far as you need to come. What? You must be the Mister Dollar I spoke to on the phone. If you didn't get the idea on the phone, I'll tell it to you again. I don't want to talk to you. Now, please get away from my home. We'll have to talk sometime. I don't think so. I know so, Mrs. Kennedy. I must ask you to take your briefcase and get out of here, Mr. Dollar, now. I'm sorry you feel that way. Look, my brother Jim drank himself to death. I don't know why. I just know he did it. He's dead. I'm his beneficiary. Why don't you pay me what you owe me? We will, Mrs. Kennedy, if the circumstances are right. So far, though, we have reasonable doubts. Uh, And this investigation is for your benefit as much as it is ours. I can hardly believe that. When we've satisfied ourselves one way or the other, your claim will be settled. The whole situation's cut and dry. I'm afraid it isn't. Mr. Dollar, I've had enough of this. I'll turn the matter over to my attorneys. Mrs. Kennedy, I don't carry this briefcase to impress anybody, but I thought it might interest you. I have in it a copy of the physical examination your brother took two years ago when he applied for his insurance policy. I have a copy of the coroner's report and the results of the autopsy. I don't care what you have. Then maybe you'd just be interested in the conclusion. We have to discredit one item or the other. That's why we can't take any action on your claim yet. Goodbye. Wait. What is it you want to know? I haven't seen my brother in well over two years, three years. I can't tell you a thing about him. Were you on good terms with him? Of course I was. I was the only one he had in the world. He left me his insurance money, didn't he? Did he leave you anything else? He didn't have anything else. I understand there was a trust in the family. He spent his a long time ago. I understand you're a widow, Mrs. Kennedy. I don't see what bearing that has. Do you have any dependents? No children, that's what you mean. The money from the policy would have gone to you alone. Let me correct you. The money will come to me alone. I don't know what you people think you can do trying to weasel out of this payment, but I've already spoken with my attorneys, and they've advised me to sue for an immediate settlement and damages. Perhaps I can save you some fees and your attorney some time, Mrs. Kennedy. Where can I contact them? Never mind. You'll find out soon enough. I hope you won't allow them to go so far as a courtroom without speaking to me. We'll see about that, too. I don't need your advice. Now, look, I'm going to tell you exactly what I'd tell them. You can pass it on to them. Your brother could have died quietly in his bed one night, and any doctor would have pronounced him a heart failure, and your claim would have been honored without delay. But James Lansing made the mistake of dropping dead on a public street, and the police took over, and before he was properly identified, an autopsy had been performed. And I intend to sue the city for that kind of liberty. They had no right to... They had every right. An unknown man dead on the street from unknown causes. Now, don't be childish. Because of that autopsy, we know your brother couldn't possibly have passed an insurance examination two years ago or ten years ago. Not with the amount of bad health he'd collected. But he did pass it. The insurance company accepted him as a client. They issued a policy, and you can't deny it. Jim came to me the day after he took out that policy and told me I was his you beneficiary. You said he... You said you hadn't seen him for well over two years. He took the exam a year ago last July. All right, I saw him that one time. Look, I'll lay it right on the line, Mrs. Kennedy. We don't think your brother ever took that physical examination. What? Someone else went up to Dr. Mayhood's office and took it for him. Someone who could pass it. Mrs. Kennedy, we aren't fools and we don't like to be fooled. Now, we're going to find out who that someone was and how it was done. We're used to all sorts of tricks in this business and all sorts of bluffing, too. You can sue us for a settlement. You can sue us all over the place. With what I have right now, I'd be willing to meet you in a courtroom. I'm talking facts to you, Mrs. Kennedy, and I wish you'd talk them to me. Get out of here. Get out of here, you cheap snooper, before I call the police and have you thrown out. 
Some more expenses. Item seven. Six dollars. Lunch. For Jim Carter and myself. You pass the cream, Johnny. Thanks. Well, what do you think, Jim? Mrs. Kennedy? Yeah. Well, it's hard to say. She's going to make it as tough as she can for us, judging from her attitude toward you this morning. How does the commission feel? Well, they feel very badly that something like this has come up. They've requested us to act with discretion and to act swiftly. They're certain the entire matter can be settled without legal action. She passes sugar for uh-huh. me. Aren't they going to cooperate? They're not going to do anything until we show cause. They did mention that their action will take place in ten days, so that means we've got ten days to write such a statement. Tell me what you've learned about Mrs. Kennedy. Well, she was widowed five years ago. Her husband was a lawyer. He left her 40000 in insurance and 15000 in debts. Her family, the Lansings, had money at one time. Enough so that she gets one half of one-tenth of one percent of an oil company out on the coast. It pays her about seven fifty a month. She's managed to clear her house out in Catalina Vista and drive a Cadillac. But she could use $50,000. Of course she could use $50,000. Everybody could. Johnny, when are you going to start on the insurance agent? Hillary Franks, I've already started. If I know my Mrs. Kennedy, she won't call a lawyer or anybody else right now. She'll talk to her agent, Mr. H. Franks, and he'll have to come to us. I don't have to go to him. Johnny. When you buy a radio and it goes bad, you call up the store. They didn't manufacture the set, but you complained to them just the same. Same thing with insurance. You don't call up the company, you call up the agent who sold it to you. Hillary Frank has to call me, Jim, just to look legitimate. I hope you're right, kiddo. After lunch, I went back to my hotel room and opened up the file Jim Carter had collected on Hillary Franks. Hillary Franks, age 56, college graduate, married, two children, wife deceased, income good. No record of any kind for any offense. Highly thought of by worldwide insurance officials. The 17 years with the company sort of got me. He started as an agent when he was 39. This is Hillary Franks, Mr. Dollar. Yes, sir. I understand you're in town on a little investigation for the home office. I wonder if we could have dinner. As a matter of fact, I was going to call you, Mr. Franks. The policy I'm working on was written by you. Yes, I understand that. Mrs. Kennedy, the beneficiary, called me today. Seemed very upset. I thought perhaps we could discuss it over dinner. Anything wrong with right now at your office? Why, not a thing. I suppose you're a Mr. Dollar. Yes. Maria, that's my secretary. She's already gone for the day. I'm sorry you had to wait so long. Mr. Hillary Franks looked straight life insurance from the top of his iron gray hair to the tips of his polished brown shoes. He had a quiet manner about him and a pair of large brown eyes that looked wide open and honest. Come in. Come in, Mr. Doctor. Thank you very much for coming over. I was surprised when Mrs. Kennedy called me about this matter today. Surprised to learn that you were in town. Were you? Um, she said you'd been over to her home this morning. That's right. <laughs> Well, just what is this all about? We have reason to believe Mrs. Kennedy is a party to an attempted fraud, Mr. Franks. I gathered it was something like that. I've been writing policies for worldwide insurance for 17 years, Mr. Dollar. And this is the first time anything like this has ever happened on one of them. I believe you, Mr. Franks, and your record. But there's a first time for everything. Uh, Yes. I'm here to find out all I can about the circumstances under which you sold the policy to Mrs. Kennedy's brother. Nothing unusual about it, Mr. Dollar. I think there was. Eh? James Lansing was a bachelor. He lived in a fairly nice apartment on the other side of town. No dependents. Now, what made James Lansing a prospect for life insurance, Mr. Franks? Well, it's more of a personal thing, really, I suppose. My wife and I were interested in buying a home a couple of years ago. It was one we liked in Catalina Vista. The real estate agent happened to be James Lansing. That's how we first became acquainted. Uh Uh-huh. Mrs. Franks and I saw Lansing, oh, two or three times. Had dinner together, you know. And I managed to sell him the policy. I understood he was an engineer. He had been at one time in Los Angeles. And he was only engaged in the real estate business here for a very short time. Really a matter of a few months. I see. Did he do very well at it? I don't think so. I don't think he worked hard at it. You see, he had a fairly comfortable income from money left by his father. 
You uh, didn't buy the house from him? No. Too much? No. Mrs. Franks died rather suddenly about that time, and I had no need to buy a home. But out of the association, you interested Lansing in buying insurance from you? Yes. What kind of a man was he? Well, what do you mean? Well, uh, just your opinion, Mr. Franks. Well, just a client, Mr. Dollar. I, I looked at him and treated him just the same as any other client. But you saw him socially several times, had dinner with him. Do you do that with all your clients? I might. Uh, I remember he was trying to sell me something, too. Ah, oh, sure. <laughs> How'd he look? What? Oh, pale, thin, emaciated, what? Oh, he looked fine to me. Did he drink much? Well, uh, I don't recall. Think. It's important. Well, uh, I don't recall. Then I'll recall for you, Mr. Franks. Lansing did drink a lot on those occasions. As a matter of fact, he was soaked up most of the time. Oh, well, that's not true, Mr. Dunn. You know as well as I do, he was an alcoholic in Los Angeles, and he was an alcoholic here in Tucson. He died of malnutrition, a direct result of his alcoholic condition. Well, uh, I'm not a doctor. I had no way of ascertaining that. You don't have to be a doctor to smell booze, Mr. Franks. Did you ever meet his beneficiary? You mean his sister, uh, Mrs. Kennedy? No, no. Uh, I think I told you she telephoned me today. Never met her at all? Uh, no. Mr. Franks, I'm going to leave you for a while, and I want you to think about all we've discussed. When I come back, I might ask you the same questions again. And I'll expect some different answers. Anything you say, Mr. Dollar. Hillary Franks, 17 years insurance broker, was a bad liar. He was worse than that. He was a stupid, awkward, unprepared liar with no idea of what he was up against. He knew I was going to get him and get him good. And he didn't know what to do about it. I almost felt sorry for him. <laughs> There'll be another intriguing episode of the Lansing Fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow, a bad liar turns into a pretty good gunman. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Jim Carter, Johnny. Hi. How'd you make out with Hillary Franks? And the agent who sold the policy? He's worried, he's scared, and he's already doing everything wrong. I left him about an hour ago to think things over. Ah, Mrs. Kennedy's fighting back. What do you mean? Her lawyer served notice on us an hour ago to pay up on the policy or else. Just a bluff. Yeah, but this wasn't. She got a court order and made the coroner release her brother's body. She took it right to the crematorium. Exhibit A is a pile of ashes by now. Uh oh. Our next step is to contact the state insurance commission and have them order us to pay off or show cause. We'll have to act fast. Maybe I better go back to see Mr. Hillary Franks.
tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Tucson, Arizona, to the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. Fifty thousand. And by now I was sure it was fraud. Expense account item number eight, five dollars, stenographic services. I dictated a hastily composed letter to the State Insurance Commission advising them that Worldwide was withholding payment on the claim of Mrs. Arlene Kennedy pending a complete investigation of the circumstances of her brother's death. I enclosed copies of the original physical examination and the coroner's autopsy findings, pointing out that in our opinion it was impossible for James Lansing to have successfully passed an insurance examination in the first place. I enclosed copies of statements from the examining physician, Dr. Mayhood, and the members of his office staff all of whom were unable to identify the body of James Lansing. Expense account item 9, 52 cents, postage. I sent the letter to the state capitol special delivery in the hope it would arrive there before Mrs. Kennedy's lawyers took the anticipated action. After that, I drove back over to the office of Hillary Franks. He was the same as I left him an hour before. A little shaken, but still unable to realize quite what was happening. Yes, Mr. Dollar? Mr. Franks, I wonder if you've got anything to say to me. Nothing, Mr. Dollar. I was hoping you might want to make a statement. Oh? About what? Mrs. Kennedy's attempting to defraud your insurance company. I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Dollar. I sold her brother an insurance policy. I don't even know Mrs. Kennedy. There are a lot of things about this you say you don't know. Do you want me to lay it on the line? If you like. All right. All right. Someone else had to take that physical examination for James Lansing two years ago. I think you arranged for someone to do it, or you helped Mrs. Kennedy arrange it. I think James Lansing was insured on that basis. I think he was insured with a clean intent to defraud. Lansing's health wouldn't permit that kind of insurance. Right now, our Los Angeles men are looking into Lansing's activities there. Somewhere along the line, they're going to turn up a medical history that'll show Lansing was already dying when he came to Arizona two years ago. Now, do you have anything to say, Mr. Franks? No. I think you're being very foolish. If it isn't clear how serious this can be with you, it's noted that you arranged for Lansing's physical examination. There's nothing incriminating in that. How well do you know Dr. Mayhood? Oh, slightly. The physician is supposed to be an impartial third party. When a client has to be examined by a physician for insurance purposes, I send him to Dr. Mayhood. That's all. Dr. Mayhood sends me a Christmas card every year... I sent James Lansing to him. Just like any other? Just like any other. Oh, you worry me, Mr. Franks. You don't object to my questions or get ruffled when you're caught lying. I've given you time to think and time to make a statement regarding your part in this matter. I resent all this, Mr. Dollar. I've been an insurance broker for a good long time, and no one has ever questioned my integrity. And I think that's what you've been banking on, Mr. Franks, your reputation. Well, I've been questioning it ever since I got here, and I still question it. You couldn't have known James Lansing without being aware of his drinking habits. I'm sorry for you, Franks, but there had to be collusion here with a beneficiary, Mrs. Kennedy. And you're the logical party. Uh, Dollar... You arranged for someone else to take that examination for Lansing. Somebody who could pass it. I've given you a chance to talk to me, but you refuse. Now we'll see how you like talking to the police about it. What? I'm going to swear out a warrant for your arrest. Dollar, I'm going to charge you with attempt to defraud and collusion. And I'm going to swear out a warrant for Mrs. Kennedy, too. You're going to just go. Oh. Oh. In the three minutes it took me to recover from the blow from the paperweight and get my breath inside of me and my feet under me, Hillary Franks was well out of the way and out of sight. About that time, Jim Carter walked in. Hey, what happened to you? Hillary Franks. He got scared, swung a paperweight at me and beat it. Well, if he's playing rough, I don't want to take any chances. No, put that phone down. He hasn't admitted anything yet. Smacking you on the side of the head is admittance enough for me. No, I want a statement. I think I can get one. You have to find him first, and he's running. He won't run far, Jim. What makes you so sure? Hillary Franks doesn't know how to run. (laughs) 
It was exactly 3 o'clock in the afternoon, then. At 3.25, I was back out in Catalina Vista knocking on a familiar door. And the same familiar things began to happen all over again. What do you want? I'm here to tell you about the trouble you're in, Mrs. Kennedy. Hillary Franks gave it all away. Gave what away? Who's Hillary Franks? What are you talking about? About that insurance policy that was written up and issued in your brother's name. You're the one who stood to gain most by your brother's death after having someone else take an insurance examination for him. But you had to have help to pull it off. Hillary Franks helped you. For what reason or how you got him to do it, I don't know. But I do know a man with a 17-year record as insurance broker is ruined. You're crazy. I don't know anybody named Hillary Franks. Now get out of here. Oh, stop it, will you? I told him how he stood in this matter a half hour ago, and he socked me with a paperweight and beat it. I've had about enough of you, But he isn't going to run far. Principally because he doesn't know how to run, Mrs. Kennedy. He'll cool off, and he'll begin thinking about all this business in a new light. A few minutes ago, it dawned on him what he'd done. He'd kicked his whole lifetime right out the window. He'd been found out. He's lost all around. And he's going to be mad about that. And you're the one he's going to be mad at because you got him into it. I told you, I don't know anybody named Hillary Franks. That's the last time I'll say it. He'll probably want to kill you, Mrs. Kennedy. What? I said he'll think about all this and he'll probably want to kill you. Do we talk now? I don't see why. I've done nothing wrong. Who did you get to take that physical for your brother? I don't know what you're talking about. You got your brother drunk enough to sign the insurance papers, didn't you? I had nothing to do with my brother taking out life insurance and naming me his beneficiary. That was his business. Now that he's dead, it's my position to receive the payment. That's all. (sighs) Okay, Mrs. Kennedy. We'll get it all from Hillary Franks. Yes, why don't you do that? In the meantime, I hope you sleep well knowing what you've done. You'll never be able to prove any of these things you're saying. Never. And for 24 hours, it looked as if Mrs. Kennedy might have been right. There was no way to involve her unless we had a statement from Hillary Franks. And he was still missing. I set up a watch on Mrs. Kennedy's house, and Jim Carter kept an eye on Hillary Franks' place. About 10 o'clock that night, Jim Carter drove up. Hiya. Hi. Any action? No. Mrs. Kennedy's been in all the night. No one showed up. Mm hmm. How about Frank's place? No. No one there when I left an hour ago. You'd think he'd come back for a suitcase or some money or something. Yeah. Hey, Johnny. Mm hmm. I called in the police. Oh. In the name of Worldwide, I filed charges of attempted fraud and collusion against him. They issued a warrant half an hour ago. He's on an APB and all the local bulletins. Well, I suppose you had to do it, Jim. Yeah. We'll let the police handle this part from now on, huh? How about Mrs. Kennedy? We'll keep an eye on her, too. Did you file any charges against her? Not yet. We need a statement from Franks. Jim. Yeah? What would you do if you were Hillary Franks? Yeah, try to grab an airplane. Maybe get on a Nogales, cross the border. Look up a friend, borrow some money. Get out and keep traveling. <laughs> what? He won't do anything like that. Won't he? He'll find himself a place to sit down and think. In the end, the cops won't find him. He'll find us. Want to bet? <laughs> By the next morning, the police had still been unable to locate Hillary Franks. I left Jim Carter in the room on a long-distance call to the insurance commission advising them of the events up to date, drove out to Hillary Franks' office. I noticed two police officers loitering across the street as I walked in the front door. Yes? How do you do? Are you another policeman? No, no, I'm not. Have they been bothering you a lot? If you aren't a policeman and you know all about this, what do you want? I want to help Mr. Franks, if I can. I'm Johnny Dollar, Universal Adjustment Bureau. You're his secretary? Yes. How long have you worked for him? Twelve years. Do you like him? What? He's always been a fine man. I don't believe any of these things about him, and I don't see why... What's your name? I think he said Maria. Maria Vano. Maria, 
I'm not going to ask you any questions about Mr. Franks. I know enough about him now for my purposes. The rest he can tell me himself. Maria, I may be able to help him stay out of jail. I can do that if I talk to him. Well, how my do name's I... Johnny Dollar. I'm at the Pioneer Hotel. Remember that. But Mr. Dollar... I don't know whether he's phoned you yet or not. A man like that's going to need help, money. I'm not asking you if he's contacted you. But listen to me carefully. If he does phone you or contact you in any way, ask him to phone me. If you ever respected him or if you want to help him now, please ask him to telephone me. Thanks. I drove back to the hotel and waited for results. Another 12 hours went by. Ellery Franks was still missing, and Mrs. Kennedy was still refusing to admit anything. Finally, about 11 o'clock that night, my phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Hello. This is Hillary Franks. Where are you? Never mind. Dollar, they know all about me back at the home office, I suppose. Yes. I'd like to explain some things to you so you can pass them on. I'd like the people back there to know why I did it. And, well, before I leave town... You won't get far. The police are looking for you. Oh, I can get away, all right. Mr. Franks, Worldwide doesn't want to prosecute. The notoriety would be bad for them. If you'd make a statement, sign it, I think I could talk them into dropping the whole matter. Maybe we'd better get together. Come on over. Oh, no. No, I'm not that crazy. Do you know how to get to the San Javier Mission? I can find it. In 15 minutes? Right. And Dollar? Yeah? It's right out in the open. If you bring the police, I'll use a gun. I bought one this morning. All right, Mr. Franks. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Lansing Fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow, $50,000 worth of murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Jim Carter, Johnny. Anything on Hillary Franks? He just telephoned me two minutes ago. What? I'm on my way to meet him now and try and make a deal. I told him if he'd give me a statement about the attempt to fraud worldwide on Lansing's $50,000 policy, I'd do my best to have them drop charges. Well, you didn't make any promises, Johnny. I couldn't make any promises, Jim. But I'll do my best to see that the charges are dropped if he gives me that statement. Well, if he gives you that statement, I'll help you. Where are you meeting him? At the... At a place near here. He knows every cop in the area is looking for him? Yeah. Be sure he doesn't give you a bullet, kiddo. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Expense account. Submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar in Tucson, Arizona, to the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is a further accounting of expenditures during my investigation of... Well, it was a case of 50000 insurance to one Arlene Kennedy. Unless I could prove my point in the Lansing fraud. Expense account item 10, 10 bucks, cab fare, from my hotel to the Mission San Javier to talk to Hillary Franks, the insurance agent with no future ahead. I used a taxi cab instead of my rented car because I didn't want to waste time searching around for the Mission. It was a few miles outside of town over rough and broken desert roads, an ancient missionary church standing stark against the moon-filled night. Here we are, mister. Good. Here, keep the change. Don't you want me to wait for you? No, I'll get back okay. Not many places to call a cab from out here. Yeah, I know. One of the Padres, your friend? No, no, I'm new around here. You all right, mister? Hmm. You feel all right? You're loaded or something? No, why? We're coming out here at midnight. Well, it's just a whim, friend. Don't worry about it. I but sure would. Mister? Yeah? You gonna meet somebody here or something? Why? I just saw a guy standing over by the bell tower. Oh, thanks. Good night. Over here, Mr. Dollar. Careful, Dollar. Hillary Franks had a thirty-eight pointed right at my chest. In the bright moonlight, I could see that he was still wearing the same clothes he'd had on two days before in his office. He needed to shave, and judging from the circles under his eyes, he hadn't slept much. He was pale and shaken. A gun wobbled in his hand. Anybody with you? I came along. Did you tell anybody you were meeting me? Jim Carter. He's been working the case with me. Did you tell him where? No. Hey, look, you don't need that gun, Franks. Put it away. I just came here to talk with you. All right. Thanks. Want to smoke? Thank you. Why did you talk to Carter? What did he say? He said he'd help me try and have the charges dropped against you if you give us a statement. Now, you have two of us on your side, Mr. Franks, if you want to cooperate. Do you? I want to straighten out what I can, Mr. Dollar. Well, now's the time to do it. What was your deal with Arlene Kennedy, James Lansing's sister and beneficiary? I met Arlene Kennedy right after my wife died. I guess I was very low. Well, that's perfectly natural. I became interested in Arlene because we had a great many things in common. So I thought. I mean, she was a widow and had no one except her brother, James Lansing, in Los Angeles. And we went together, and eventually I asked her to marry me. But she laughed at me. Why? I guess I'm not an exciting man, a witty one, or even an interesting one, Mr. Dollar. Mrs. Kennedy made me feel as though my whole life had been hopeless, useless. Raising children, selling insurance. She made me feel as though I'd miss a great deal in life unless I married her. What is it? What do you want from me? What do you want from life, I'd ask her. And she'd only laugh. Laugh at me. Go on. I I just can't tell you how desperate it made me feel. I, I loved her, Mr. Dollar. I, I wanted her. Did she ever answer your questions? Oh, many times. She pointed out that her trust funds pay her over $700 a month for life. And she knew that my commissions and salary as a broker came to about the same. Oh, Mr. Dollar, we could have lived very comfortably on that kind of income. But Arlene talked of traveling, of Europe, of clothes, and, oh, I don't know, things her family had been able to afford for her once many years ago. And she said she wouldn't marry unless we could look forward to that kind of life. She wanted $50,000 in cash instead of money just trickling in every month. That's about it. When did she get around to the proposition, her brother's insurance? Her brother came here from Los Angeles one day. The doctors there gave him a year or two to live. Oh, yes, he was pretty shot. Been drinking for years. He'd used up all his money, oh, a long time before. He asked Arlene to help him. She paid his apartment rent and gave him enough money for liquor. And then one day, one day she came right out with it. 
She said she was investing in him. And he was a good risk. Because she knew he'd die. That's how she put it to me. Mm-hmm. Arlene said all I had to do was see to it that her brother had a nice fat policy. He was going to die. Why not cash in on it? I must have been crazy to even think about it. How did you work it? I mean, how did Dr. Mayhood pass him? I paid a man a hundred dollars to go to Dr. Mayhood's office and take the physical for Lansing. What was the man's name? Oh, no, no, I wouldn't tell you that, Mr. Dollar. He's not involved in anything. All right, we'll let that go. Once you arranged for Lansing to become insured, you and Mrs. Kennedy just planned on waiting for him to die. That was the general idea in view of what the Los Angeles doctors had said. Once I'd done it, I mean, gotten him insured, it was too late to turn back. Did you want to turn back? Yes. What did Mrs. Kennedy say about backing out? She thought I was weak and afraid. Oh, then things weren't so good between you. Oh, they never were, Mr. Dollar. The idea was to wait for Lansing to die, collect the 50000 and get married, huh? I suppose so, yes, but... But once he was insured, she talked less and less about our getting married. You're leaving something out, Mr. Franks. Huh? Didn't she tell you exactly what kind of a position you were in? Didn't she fix it so that you couldn't make a move? Legally, she'd done nothing wrong. It was you who had arranged for the physical, you who had made the application for insurance in the name of her brother. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, she was clear about all that. And she told me so every time she felt like it. When you write down what you just told me and sign it, we can hold it over Mrs. Kennedy's head to prove attempted to fraud and collusion. Now, would you do that, Mr. Franks? Yes. Then I guess we'd better get back into town. All right. Come on, Mr. Franks. We walked three miles over to the highway, flagged down a car, and got back to the hotel about 2.30 in the morning, got Jim Carter out of bed. Enclosed my notarized statement of Hillary Franks explaining his part in the matter regarding policy 678JN230L. Before he was finished, Carter had already telephoned the Tucson police, telling them that the charges were being dropped against Franks and that he was no longer a fugitive. Then he placed a long-distance call to Worldwide's president in Hartford. Jim Carter, sir. I want to ask you not to prosecute Hillary Franks in this matter. Yes, sir, he's given us a complete statement about the whole thing. I don't think we have to go any farther than that. Well, look, the guy made one mistake. The first one in 17 years, he suffered enough for it already. Yes, sir. Dollar feels that way, too. Yes, sir. I think it's okay, Mr. Franks. All right. I thank you. What are you going to do, Mr. Franks? Well, I'm sure I'll never sell insurance again. I, I think I'll close up and just move away. Far away. Thank you. Poor guy. Oh, let's clean up the rest of this and get out of this town. Sure, Johnny. Hillary Franks pulled out of Tucson that afternoon. When Mrs. Kennedy was shown a carbon of the enclosed statement of Hillary Franks, she instructed her attorneys to withdraw the suit against Worldwide. Expense account, item 11, $75, hotel and board while in Tucson. Item 12, $402.15, plane tickets, Tucson to Hartford for Carter and myself. We were scheduled to leave at 1.30 in the morning. Two hours before plane time, I dropped by Mrs. Kennedy's house to have her sign a release of all claims on the insurance company. And for other reasons. I carried Arlene Kennedy to the couch and I did what I could for her. I phoned the police and told them to bring an ambulance. After that, I began looking around. I found a dark stain on the window still leading outside to the back of the house. On the floor, a blood-stained letter opener. There was no gun in sight anywhere. I decided if I had been stabbed with a letter opener, it would be easier to try to make it out the back way than risk the street that was bound to be full of policemen any minute. I was right. (laughs) 
Hillary Franks was on a ledge of rock that rose above the back of the house. I ducked behind some cactus plants. Get away from me! You know I won't. You know I wouldn't when I let you walk out this afternoon. Johnny Dollar! That's right. Now put that gun away and come on off that ledge. Get away! Go away! You missed by a mile. You don't know anything about shooting a gun. Come on down. Stay where you are. Don't do anything foolish. I'm coming after you. I'll, I'll shoot! Shot. Now, uh, Can you walk? No. Why did you do it, Mr. Franks? I came back to see her tonight. She laughed at me. Said if we had gotten the insurance money, she she was planning to run away with someone else. Oh. She just used me all along. Mrs. Kennedy was dead when the police got there. Hillary Franks died en route to the receiving hospital. Item 13, 15 bucks, hotel, one more night in Tucson. Expense account total, $1,121.13. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story beginning next Monday night. Next week, a quick trip to New York, to the bright lights, the glamour of Broadway with its theaters, its actors, and, uh, yeah, some very bad actors. You might even say killers. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Vivi Janis, Jean Tatum, High Everback, Barney Phillips, Russell Thorson, and Howard McNear. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. their signatures. It looks like my signature, Mr. Dollar. I can't say for sure if it is or isn't. All right, what about these? Are these notations on the form in your handwriting? I would think so. I don't know. It it looks like my handwriting. I can't say. According to this form, you gave Mr. Lansing a complete physical and pronounced him sound. That's my job as a doctor on these insurance examinations. Anything unusual about that? Mr. Lansing died two days ago, Doctor. There's nothing unusual about that either. Did they send you all the way from Hartford so I could tell you to go back there and buy a book on heart disease? You can get them anywhere in the country. The simplest kind. Not even a doctor's book. Read it. Know it. And don't take up my valuable time. Now, let me have that. Sure. Hmm. This patient Lansing was 41 years old. If he had no heart condition when I examined him two years ago, and obviously he didn't, according to my findings, it's entirely reasonable to assume that he could have developed heart trouble in a very short while, even the day after I examined him. 
You people gauge those things in your premiums. Why do you bother me? Are you finished? Huh? I take it you've had yourself a tough day, Doctor, and you don't want to be bothered with anybody. Now, look, I'm not here to bother you. you Just from what's on this sheet and what's happened, you're in enough trouble to get yourself involved in a police investigation. I'm here to try to avoid all that for you as well as me. And please don't lecture me on heart trouble, incidentally. We know the statistics by age, race, color, climate, state, religion, occupation, geographical area, and sex. It so happens we don't have to go into that, Doctor. James Lansing died of malnutrition. Hmm? I said Lansing died of malnutrition. I'll be doggone. Coroner's report. Look for yourself. Well, he should know. Now... Was it possible for you to overlook that condition at the time you examined Lansing? If he'd been suffering from malnutrition in any degree, I would have discovered it and noted it. According to the coroner's findings, James Lansing had been ill several years. The lung and heart condition existed at least ten years. Can you explain how you were able to pronounce him physically fit, doctor? No, I can't. Well, how about this, the angina condition? I could have missed that, but it's unlikely with the degree of aggravation noted here on the coroner's report. Have you had much experience reading chest x-rays, Doctor? Of course. The lesions reported by the coroner. If there'd been any lesions on Lansing's chest, I would have reported them. I can't explain that either. Well, now you understand why I'm here. Certainly. I wish I could help you. You can. Just let me see your file copy of the examination and the x-ray you took at that time. I'll have my nurse look them up. I don't keep files over a year old up here. We have a place down in the basement. Okay. I'll have them for you tomorrow. What time tomorrow? As soon as possible. Like to have them first thing, Doctor. You're kind of on me, aren't you? That's right, Doctor. I'm kind of on you. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Lansing fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow, $50,000 is a good price for a killing. Most anybody will listen for that kind of money. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, kiddo. Carter at Universal Adjustment. Jim, how are you? In a rush. I have to catch a plane to Tucson, Arizona. Lucky you. Nice there this time of year. No, no, listen. One of our brokers out there wrote a 50,000 straight life policy on a man named James Lansing. Lansing dropped dead two days ago. Uh Uh-huh. And you'll never guess why. I'll bite. Why? Mr. Lansing starved to death. What? With a 50,000... Honest. He died of malnutrition. Got the coroner's report from Tucson right in my hand. Well, if a man could buy a $50,000 policy, he ought to be able to buy himself a square meal. Yeah. Johnny, flight 203 leaves at 1045. You interested? See you at the airport, Jim. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account, submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. 
Expense account item one, $178.13. Cost of plane ticket, Hartford to Tucson. I shaved, showered, packed, and got out to the airport in time to have breakfast there. Jim Carter found me at the cashier's cage. Hey, kiddo, you won't need a coat out there in that desert country. As usual, Jim Carter was bigger than I thought. A man who stands six foot five always is. A little ruddier, a little more blustery, but as efficient as ever. I wrote a special delivery airmail to the insurance commission in Arizona this morning and explained it worldwide. They wrote the policy. We're holding up payment pending investigation. Well, you could have told them that in person. We'll be out there as soon as the letter. Well, I like to be formal on these things, especially with the state commission. Besides, I'd just as soon let them think we'll get around to a routine investigation later in a week or two. In know? other words, you didn't tell anybody we're coming. No, I didn't. Maybe we can work it better this way. The faster we move in and find out what's what and aren't bothered by anybody, the better off we'll be. Hey, give me your ticket, will you, Jim? Yeah, sure. Here you are, pal. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Johnny, that commission is going to get formal sooner or later and ask a lot of questions. Mainly, why doesn't Worldwide honor the claim and pay off the beneficiary? So we'll have to skedaddle and get ourselves some good answers for him. Yeah, sir. You may board the plane. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, pal. Has anybody asked that question yet? Well, the beneficiary, sure. Uh, James Lansing's sister, named uh, Arlene Kennedy. She called the broker, and he referred her to claims division at Worldwide, and she called them long distance, and then they called me. I told her to put her off for a while, telling her it was just routine. I see. Is she going to be tough? Yeah, she could be, Johnny. I understand she has money of her own, and she has some influence in and around Tucson. Oh, a lot of money? Yeah, and trust. She's very comfortably fixed. Yeah, watch yourself, kiddo. This, uh, Mrs. Kennedy's pretty upset by the whole business. Can't blame her for that. James Lansing died on the street with no identification on him. By the time police found out who he was, a routine PM had already been performed to determine cause. You know, the county was going to bury this guy? With $50,000 worth of insurance? Yeah, <laughs> imagine that. Oh, excuse me, lady. Uh, the post-mortem never had happened unless Lansing dropped dead on a public street. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, I requested the coroner's office in Tucson to hold the body until we can get something done. Better fix your seatbelt, sir. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Yeah. First thing that occurred to me when I saw the PM findings was that it might not be James Lansing at all. Chronic heart condition, lung history, debility. Doesn't sound like anybody worldwide would insure. Lansing took a physical before the policy was issued, didn't he? Of course he did. See, have you got any material on his insurance examination? Sure. Right here. Standard form. James Lansing was 100% okay when the policy was issued a couple of years ago. Malnutrition, lung history, chronic heart. Huh. How could he get in that bad shape in two years? <laughs> That's a pretty good question, Johnny. I bet the answer is going to be... I don't forget for one minute. Nor do I forget that what you found and what an autopsy surgeon found are completely different opinions on Lansing's physical condition. Here we go, boys. There's the body. Pull the sheet back, please. Yeah. Well, doctor? I called my lawyer after you called me today. I won't be intimidated, Mr. Dollar. You aren't being intimidated, doctor. You're being asked to cooperate. Then maybe I don't like the way you ask for cooperation. My attorney will be in my office to represent me if you bother me any more about this. You want to look at this body? Your attorney can't refute what's already been established, doctor. You pronounced James Lansing in good physical condition two years ago. An autopsy report shows that when he died two days ago, he was in very bad physical condition. So bad that two years ago he couldn't possibly have gone through a careful examination in your office without some of the symptoms being detected by you. Where is your medical degree and what responsibility? Oh, why don't you shut up and take a look and tell me if you've ever seen this man before? I won't be spoken to that way. Just a minute. I'll get an injunction and I'll charge malpractice and negligence if I have to. Oh? On what grounds? You're being stupid, doctor. All you have to do is look at that corpse and tell me if he's the man you examined in your office two years ago. Well? I don't know whether I've seen this man before or not. Well, does he look familiar in any way? I can't say. I might have examined this man. I don't know. This is James Lansing, Doctor. The name you filled in on your physical examination for the insurance. I know that. Is this the man you examined? I don't know. I honestly don't know. It was two years ago. 
If I see a man for three hours in the course of a physical examination, am I expected to remember his face or any details about him two years later? Is there any way you can determine whether or not this is the man you examine in your office? No. Not that I know of. Is there any way you can determine it? Believe me, Doctor, I can try. And I did try. That afternoon, over the protests of Dr. Mayhood, I took all of the personnel connected with his office down to the morgue. A nurse, a receptionist, the x-ray technician, and a laboratory worker. None of them recognized the body of James Lanson. Expense account item five, ten cents, one phone call to Jim Carter, who'd spent the day preparing the necessary forms for the insurance commission and gathering data on Lansing's beneficiary. You think Dr. Mayhood was in on it? He's too mad, too belligerent, Jim. You don't sound too sure. Well, and maybe he just strikes me as an inept doctor. Well, let's say Mayhood's way down on my list. He examined a man who said he was James Lansing. It could have been anybody. All right, we'll let it go that way for a while. Any ideas? I'm on my way out to Lansing's old address. He had an apartment on the other side of town. I want to see how he's lived out there. Still want me to go ahead with the insurance commission? Yeah, go ahead. The manager at James Lansing's apartment house happened to be a woman named Anita Regan. She also happened to be willing to go back down to the coroner's office with me and view the mortal remains. There you are. Oh. Have you ever seen this man before, Mrs. Regan? Yes, yes, sir. That's that's Mr. Lansing, apartment 34. You're positive? Oh, yes. I've seen him every day for almost two years. Okay. Want to smoke? I want to get out of here. Oh, sure. I don't know why I'm acting this way. He doesn't look any different now than he's looked before. I've seen him stretched out like that a hundred times. What? I mean, almost like that. Out, stony. Only I guess it's because I knew he was just drunk then, not dead. Oh, I see. He was crazy carrying on the way he did. (laughs) Feels good to be out in the sunlight again. Yeah. I'll take that smoke now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, sure. Thank you. Well, Mr. Lansing used to get up around ten every morning. He'd look awful, but he was always kind of nice, polite, you know. He'd be regular as clockwork. He'd walk past my door and tip his hat and go right down to the store and come back in a little while with a sack of groceries, a bottle of milk for his cat, and some donuts for himself, and some booze. Uh-huh. And then... Great. Yeah. What's the examining physician's name? Uh, I see. Examining... Oh, here it is. Uh, Dr. Carl Mayhood, Suite 932, Valley National Building, Tucson. He's our first job, Johnny. Hey, cute stewardess. Yeah. Well, back to business, kiddo. It was a long trip, and I spent most of it going over the material in Jim Carter's briefcase. By the time we circled Tucson Airport at 4.45 in the afternoon, I had the facts pretty well in mind. Expense account item two, 350, cab fare, Tucson Airport to the Pioneer Hotel. Jim Carter and I took adjoining rooms. I unpacked my clothes and got on the phone. A Sergeant Younger, Tucson police, had made the DOA report on James Lansing. Yes, he was in. Yes, he'd be glad to talk to me. I left Jim Carter contacting the state medical board. Glad to meet you, Mr. Dollar. How do you like Tucson? Well, I've been here two hours, Sergeant. Weather's certainly nice. About like this all through the winter months. It's a little warm in the summer, though. Yes, sir. Um, now this Lansing matter. Yeah. There isn't really much to tell you, Mr. Dollar. One of the cars answered the call. A man was found dead in the doorway of a jewelry store about four blocks down the street. Uh-huh. This was the uh, day before yesterday, Sergeant? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I went down to the scene and called the coroner's office. No identification on him, so we started to check him out. Took us a little while. By the time we got a make on him, the coroner had already performed an autopsy. Yeah, I understood that was about the way it was. Say, tell me, how did you identify him as Lansing? One of his prints matched up on our cards here. Lansing was booked on a traffic beef a year ago. Otherwise, we'd still be trying to make him. 
You're sure it's Lansing over in the morgue? Yeah, we're sure. His sister came down, identified him. Name of Kennedy. Yes. Well, what did Mrs. Kennedy have to say about the cause of death? Nothing. That malnutrition bit didn't do a thing for her, huh? Not a thing, no, sir. We all thought Lansing was some sort of a transient. You know, just some old bum until we identified him. Uh-huh. Any witnesses see him die? No, we haven't found any. According to the coroner, he'd been dead an hour or so before anybody noticed him at all. Happened early in the morning. I see. Say, did uh, Lansing have any other business down here other than that uh, traffic violation? Nope. All right. Uh, who do I have to see to get into the morgue? Well, I'll phone the coroner for you. Won't be any trouble there. You want to go over now? No, later on, maybe. Uh, Dollar. Yeah? Death was from natural causes. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Then no matter how much you investigate, you people are going to have to pay off. Well, aren't you? Maybe. We just have to be sure of one thing. What's that? That we insured the right man. By the time I finished with Sergeant Younger, it was six o'clock. I phoned the hotel and Jim Carter, busy and efficient as always, had already gotten the vital statistics on Dr. Carl Mayhood. Northwestern University Medical School, 1940. Army Medical Corps, 1941 to 45. Dr. Mayhood's license to practice medicine in Arizona was issued in June of 1946. Married, two children, income and practice, according to Carter, was average. In person, Dr. Mayhood was a tall, blonde man in his late 30s. He looked like he needed a week's rest and a few laughs. Day and night. You have an alarm clock around the house, Mrs. Garland? Well, use that. Yes. Goodbye. Yes, sir? Dr. Mayhood, my name's Johnny Dollar. I'm from Hartford. I represent the Adjustment Bureau handling a claim for worldwide insurance. Well, what does that mean? I'm an investigator. So? July 14th, 1953, you examined a man I'd like to get some information about. I hope this won't take too long. Uh, Was it an insurance examination? Yeah. The man's name was James Lansing. Do you happen to remember him? James Lansing... No, I can't say that I do remember him, Mr. Dollar. What about him? Well, I'd like to show you the standard examination form first. Is this your signature? Hmm. Is that your signature, Doctor? I suppose so, yes. I don't know. Aren't you sure? Well, how many people are certain of... From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Mayhood, I sent you a copy of Lansing's insurance examination this morning. Did you get it all right? Yes, I did, Doctor. Thank you very much. Just looked it over. And I take it everything's all right. It's an exact duplicate of the one sent to the insurance company, and that part's okay. But it doesn't straighten out matters on this case. I'm not concerned with your case particularly. I just hope you're through bothering me, Mr. Dollar. Not quite. What does that mean? I want another hour of your time, Doctor. I want you to go over to the coroner's office with me and look at Mr. Lansing's body. What for? To identify it. I've got to know if he's the man you examined or not. About an hour? Doctor, I can get an injunction. All right. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Tucson, Arizona. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is a further accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. Or was it a fraud? Expense account item three, $10, loan. To Jim Carter, who was working with me on the case. Thanks, buddy. I'll pay you back as soon as I can cash a check. Been so busy, I haven't had time. 
How's your doctor friend? Well, I'm going to pick him up pretty soon and go over to the coroner's office. I want him to look at James Lansing and see if he's the same man he passed on the insurance examination two years ago. Either we insured the wrong man or Dr. Mayhood examined the wrong man. I don't know which. How have you done so far? Well, besides what I told you yesterday about Dr. Mayhood? Yeah. Well, he's in healthy financial shape. Not good or bad, but, you know, healthy. His house halfway paid for, he owns one car outright, and has eight months to go on another one. All of which doesn't mean anything if he phonied up an insurance examination. Yeah, that's true, kiddo, that's true. You know, I've been thinking. This would have worked, but James Lansing died on the street and the city performed an autopsy. Death, malnutrition. For a private physician, without an autopsy hanging over him, it could have been heart failure or most anything. Jim, I think we can do whatever we want around here. Step on anybody's toes, make any kind of noise we like. With this kind of situation to investigate, we don't have to be careful. Easy, Johnny. Lansing's body's in the morgue. There's no doubt that it's him, Exhibit A. But we aren't sure that his $50,000 policy was issued legitimately. What are you getting to? Call the state insurance commission, Jim. Let them know we think this is a bad one from top to bottom. Let them know that so that when the beneficiary starts to complain, they can tell her. It might scare her and whoever helped her into being more ridiculous than they've been already. I'm going to hold off, Johnny. Why? Until I see how you and Dr. Mayhood make out at the morgue. Expense account item four, two dollars, cab fare. From my hotel to the Valley National Building. I picked up a scowling Dr. Mayhood and we drove over to the coroner's office. Mr. Dollar, this is a waste of your time and mine. Sorry to inconvenience you, doctor, but it's necessary. I suppose so. And I suppose you have a job to do. But I have a job, too. Mr. Franks, the insurance broker, telephones me and says he's sending over a man for a physical. I do the physical. It's immaterial to me whether the man I examine is qualified for insurance or not. My job is to examine him. It's up to the insurance company to determine... Yeah? Johnny Dollar, this is Dr. Mayhood. I believe Sergeant Younger phoned. Yeah, yeah, this way. Dollar, it's up to the insurance company to do what they want to about the examination. I understand all that, Doctor. Then don't ignore it with your high-pressure tactics. Because examination is the only part I have to do with this business. I examined a man named James Lansing two years ago. You have a copy of my findings on that examination. I stand on them. And don't forget it. 